G'day and welcome back to another episode of Tommy's Tune Ups. On this episode, we're finally back on the 1275 A Plus engine. We have the new engine plate and we're going to be installing it. So I'm gonna show you how to install an engine plate along with a vernier setup style timing chain kit. All right, so as always, let's get to it. First thing we're going to be doing is grabbing the new gasket. So this is going to be going between the block and the new plate. We've also got two new retaining screws which are recessed with the head of the bolt. So it is very important that you make sure you use these screws in particular. That way you can guarantee there's going to be no leaks because if it bottoms out, it's going to push the plate off from the bottom of the crank and therefore it's going to leak. Now you want to be applying a bit of gasket sealant on each side of this. You can use spray or in my case we're going to be using the aviation sealant. Alright, so we're just going to grab our gasket and get a little bit of our Permatex sealant on there. And we're just going to lubricate it on either side. If you want you can always just do one side first, fit it, and then do the other side once it's mounted. So the important thing that we want to be doing first is making sure that you get it fitted the right way. So obviously it doesn't go like this, but it will go the opposite way. So you pretty much want to make sure that you line up all of the bolt holes, especially the two down the bottom. Once you've got the two down the bottom lined up, you're pretty much right to start lubricating it so it can start sealing and then reinstall the cover plate. Now this is a really good idea to do. Um, by upgrading the cover plate because they do tend to warp over time and it is best to just upgrade it. Although this one cost about 130 Australian dollars delivered, it is worth its weight in gold. Now that we have the gasket installed, we can now grab the engine plate as well. All right, so we pretty much just need to line that up with where it needs to be. And then what we're gonna do is just put in the two bolts down the bottom here. Once we've fitted the two bolts, we are then going to fit the camshaft thrust plate, which is gonna go around here as well. So i am just gotta move it around till we find where the holes are. So just be nice and gentle, making sure that all of the bolt holes line up before you start tightening all of these bolts. That way you can guarantee that you're not going to move the gasket and it's not going to do any damage to it either. So pretty much I'll just do these up by hand and then we'll go ahead and we'll do the camshaft thrust plate. Okay, so we grab our new camshaft thrust plate. Now these will only go on one way, so if you're having trouble, just keep turning it until you find it the way that it goes. So from memory, it sits like that. So a good way to remember is this little oil feed hole um, angles down towards the crankshaft. So I'm fairly convinced that it's going to be these three here. These are the only three individual bolts uh, that are quite short, but they also have a flat surface on the top where the bolt head is as well. So let's put these in and see how we go. So once again, just wiggle the plate around just to find where it needs to sit with the bolt hole at the back, as well as the gasket, making sure that you don't damage the gasket. And actually, I think I might have that on wrong. All right, what an absolute rookie. So I got this wrong to begin with. So what we need to do is on the face of this, it has the part number, which is TAM2014. So we're just going to move that around until we find where it sits nicely, which is definitely not gonna be there but it is likely going to be here, I would say. Yep, so I did have it right the first time, but the hole was on the opposite side because it was inside out. Make sure that the hole is facing towards the water pump so it has a shorter distance between the bolt hole and the securing hole as well. All right, so there we have it. So they're all in just finger tight at the moment, which is perfect and what we need and what we want to be able to keep going. So make sure the distance between this hole and the bolt hole is shorter 
on the side where the water pump is, not on the side where the gearbox is. I'm just gonna grab a four mil Allen key and then we can tighten it up. So you're probably wondering about this quad bike behind me. I have um, started quoting the job essentially. Um, we're going to be replacing the top end on the engine. So we're going to be doing a piston set of rings, um, head gasket, um, and probably a set of valve stem seals on it because it is burning so much oil, it is out of control. Now we can go and tighten the camshaft thrust plate bolt. Okay, so find the right size, which is going to be 3.8. And then we're just gonna nip those up. And then we can start the process to do the timing. So with the timing, I'm actually gonna give my mate from Classic Mini Garage a quick call, do a video call with him figure out how I need to do it, and then show you guys how to do it. So if you ever have any questions, hit him up on either YouTube or social media, such as uh, the link in the description below for Instagram. Um, he's a really knowledgeable guy. He's very down to earth, knows a lot about these engines, which is really good. So yeah, I, I cannot stress it enough for that. If you are having trouble with your classic mini engine, hit him up or even um, classic mini DIY. All right, so this is the timing chain kit that we're gonna be using. This is an Australian built chain. It is made by Rollmaster and it is specifically for A-series engines. So it is a vernier set. So we are able to adjust the cam sprocket depending where we need to set the timing up at. Now in the kit, it does come with a set of instructions and also a set of gears with a new timing chain. So. On the front here, it is important that you make note, bolts are loose and must be tensioned to five foot pound after the cam has been degreed. So once you've got it set to where you need it to be, these Allen key bolts are around here need to be tightened to five foot pound. So make sure you take note of that. If you buy a different brand, uh, make sure you follow the instructions as per what they recommend. So if it says to torque them up, make sure you use a torque wrench on these. All right, so welcome back. Uh, we were up to almost midnight, well I was anyway, when I had Jeff from Classic Mini Garage on uh, the phone. So he helped me set this up. We're just gonna strip it and start from scratch and then work our way through it with the easiest way that we found to get it done. Uh, it did take us quite a long time, only because we were having a bit of trouble with one of the lifters sticking. So we got that rectified. So we got everything set up. We will start from scratch. I'll show you the tips and tricks to get it set up. So let's get into it. All right, so here's Tomo's tech tip. So before you go and start the reassembly process or even installing the timing chain for the first time, get the old gears for the crank and the camshaft, line them up so they are facing each other dot to dot. This will ensure that the cam and crankshaft is at the base setting for the engine when it is need to be timed. That way, when you get your new chain, you're not gonna be sitting there fart ass and about for ages trying to line everything up. And it also enables you to ensure that when you install the new chain, that it is going on the correct way. Now the problem that we had when we installed this originally was the fact that it was out by probably one tooth. So as much as we adjusted it one way, we started to move in the right direction, but then we tapped out quite easily with the amount of advance that we had. Even though you tried to retard it, it didn't actually go on correctly. So it took us a while to work that out, but we finally got there. So line up your cam and crank and you're just gonna slide them on. Make sure also that the keyways are in the crankshaft and in the camshaft. Sometimes when you go to put the camshaft sprocket on, you'll find the keyway will actually push out from behind. So it'll push it and then kick on a bit of an angle resulting in the surface of the camshaft sprocket not going all the way onto the camshaft. So line up both of your keyways and then just slowly push it all the way on. Now this is a fully adjustable timing chain set. And because I just took this off, it went on quite easily. So what we need to do, just give it a bit of a wiggle and get it all the way down. Now I should have also mentioned behind this camshaft sprocket are a couple of spaces between the end of the block and the crankshaft sprocket. This just makes sure that everything is in line. So test fit it beforehand, make sure that both the gears are in line. If they're not, you may need more or less shims depending how the setup is. And we're gonna grab that on there. We're just gonna give it a couple of light taps. 
All right, so now you can see that the surface is starting to come through with the camshaft. So we're just gonna grab our new nut, which is this one here, and we're just gonna wind that on. So this doesn't need to be tight just yet, but we are just going to nip it up with our hand, just so that way we can push the camshaft sprocket on. All right, so now everything's on there nice and firm. The crankshaft sprocket's all the way on, the camshaft sprocket is on. So what we need to be doing next is grabbing our degree wheel. Now, I bought this one from Mini Sport down in South Australia. So it is undersized on the inside here. So all I had to do was just drill it out a little bit and just cut it. I grabbed the crankshaft bolt and just drove it straight through its home. And so long as it can move freely side to side and it's not overlaid or anything around the inside of the degree wheel, you should be fine. So what we're gonna do is just tighten that up just by hand. So we're not gonna use any tools whatsoever to tighten that. So you just wanna nip it up against the crankshaft. Now, this bolt here, I've just got a UNC bolt with a bit of length on it and a little bit of wire at the end of it. So what we're gonna be doing is setting the crankshaft to top dead center number one. So number one cylinder is this one here. So where my hand is, where the dial gauge indicator is. So I've just got a little bit of wire just pointing down here. So this is what's gonna enable us to set the top dead center mark for number one and then set it on the degree wheel. That way we can read it as we rotate it around. So what we're gonna to do to begin with, I'm just going to release the dial gauge indicator off the top of the push rod because we don't need that just yet. Now we're not gonna be turning the crankshaft from the front, we're gonna be turning it from the back. So I'll just quickly flip it around. All I like to do is just grab a long screwdriver or even just a small extension and just wedge it in the back of the flywheel and then just turn it side to side. So I'll just grab my screwdriver and then I'll just wedge it in the back here and then just turn it. Alternatively, you can get the bolt, stick it in the end and then turn it, but you do need to rock it back and forth. So what you wanna be doing is facing this towards you when you do it. That way, when you go to set it and turn it, you can see exactly where the measurement is. Now mine's got a magnetic base, so I'll just turn that magnet on and that's not going to move without any force. So essentially you want to have a bit of preload on the top of the piston. That way, when the piston comes all the way to the top, you will see it move on the dial gauge indicator and then it will come to a complete stop and then start moving back down once it has reached its top dead center side. So we just want to find out exactly where top dead center is. I've probably got about three mil of preload on there, so that's fine. Um, and you wanna make sure you're doing it on the flat part of the piston as well. Perfect, all right, cool. So it doesn't matter where it's gonna sit just yet. What we wanna be doing is just focusing on where the dog edge indicator starts to stop and where it starts to move. So what I'm gonna be doing is just rocking this back and forth just to see where it gets to its highest point and then going back the opposite way. So we're actually going the wrong way because it is going down. So we wanna bring it all the way to the opposite side Wait till it starts to stop, which is going to be about here. All right, so once the dog edge indicator has stopped, we know that is now the highest point of the piston, so how high it's going to travel. Now, we're gonna flip the engine back around. We're not gonna be using the dog edge indicator anymore on the top of the piston. The next thing we're gonna be doing is using it on the top of the push rod. So what we wanna be doing now is looking at our degree wheel. Because the degree wheel is not facing the correct way, we just wanna be rotating that by hand. So I'm just gonna loosen that crank bolt off just a bit to enable us to turn it around. So what you wanna be doing is putting a bolt in one of these holes and no matter where you have it, set it to the top dead center and then make your reference mark. So we're just going to nip this up here. So it's sitting directly on top. So it's directly in line with where it says top and then obviously down the bottom here as well. What we're gonna be doing next is putting the dial gauge indicator with several millimeters of preload on the top of push rod number one, which is the second one along. So this is the inlet valve. This is what we wanna be aiming it off. Once again, you want to be facing the dial gauge indicator towards you because we're going to be at the back of the engine. Not sure if you'll be able to see the dial gauge indicator because of the brightness of the light, but hopefully we can see something along those lines. So dial gauge indicators, you just gotta be super careful with them because they are a fragile piece of equipment. So just be careful when you're setting it up. Sometimes they do take a little bit of finesse, I, I believe would probably be the right word. 
So we're gonna set it with about five mil of preload. So about 50% of what it actually is capable of doing. All right, so it might be a bit difficult to see the dog edge indicator here, but essentially it's pointing just between the six and seven o'clock position on the indicator. So we're gonna grab our screwdriver, we're gonna rotate the crankshaft around and we're gonna find out exactly where top dead center is. So how you know where top dead center is on the top of the camshaft lobe is this dog edge indicator will spin erratically all the way one way, so it's going to its highest point. Once it reaches its highest point, it'll then start to stop and then it will start to go back the opposite way. So once we get to the highest point where it stops, set the dog edge indicator to zero and then we start taking a measurement. So we're going to move the needle to a particular spot on each of the sides. So for instance, if the zero is here, we want to be moving it to say 10 or even five on either side. Once we get our measurement, we're then going to read it on the center wheel down below here, take the measurement one side, go back, go the opposite way, do the same distance from the zero all the way across to the next one. So in our case, it might be either five or 10. Take another measurement, we're then going to add the two together, divide it by two. So long as it's between 100 and 104, we should be fine to set the timing. So we want to be turning the engine anti-clockwise to begin with. So it's going to be pulling towards me. So we'll just keep going. All right, so we're pretty much at the zero position at the moment. So we'll just keep going. And then once it gets to its next point, you should start to see it move. So we'll just confirm it's going bananas at the moment. There, it's pretty much tapped out at zero. It's not gonna go any further because I haven't allowed enough preload on it, but that's fine. We can just come back to that and we can readjust it. So what I'm gonna do is just apply another mil of preload on there. That way, it's not just gonna tap out too soon. Okay, so we're gonna keep going the same way. So it's going the opposite way now. We just wanna be rotating it backwards until it comes to a complete stop. Pretty happy there. So just a real finesse, just turning it nice and easy without making too many mods on it. So you wanna set the dog edge indicator again to zero. What we wanna be doing is we're going to move it one way or the other and then return it back to zero and then go the opposite way. So in our case, we're going to move the crankshaft anti-clockwise and we're going to bring it to either the 10 or the 90, so it just depends which way it moves. So if I come back, you just wanna be moving it nice and slow. Okay, so it is a little bit notchy, but that's all right. It just hasn't had any oil or movement in it before. So just be really careful with your measurements. You pretty much want to bang on the same measurement on each side, so it might just take a little bit of finesse just to get it into the right spot. All right, so now we have it at the 90, so it's 10 units backwards. We're now gonna be reading the dial gauge indicator at the front of the engine. Okay, so I'll just take that out and you can get a bit better look. So at the moment, we are pointing towards approximately 84, I would say. Yeah, so comfortably, I would say 84. So we're gonna ride that down and we're gonna go the opposite way and get our next measurement. All right, so the same thing again, we still set at 90, so we're gonna go back the opposite way. So we're now turning direction of rotation, so it'll be um, moving forwards away from the engine rather than towards me. So make sure it comes back to the zero position as well. So we're just gonna bring it back to the 90 as well, just nice and gently, and then we take our other measurement. So I've just gone a little bit past there. As I said, you just gotta finesse it just a little bit, so just give it some Gentle taps, we should be able to get it back. All right, cool, that is bought on actually. Come look at it. Now we go back to our sender wheel at the front. So um, I'll just grab the GoPro and I'll show you where we're at. So this is a little of mucking around, but you do have to get this right. So at the moment we are sitting at approximately uh, 121 to, I'd probably comfortably say 123. So let's put those measurements together and see what we get. All right, so our first measurement was 84 and 123. Yes, I know I'm not doing this up the right way. You should always have the larger number at top. So for those of you mathematicians out there, thank you. Zero, 
it's 207 divided by 2 so you're pretty much looking at uh, 103 and a half so we're pretty much spot on to where we need to be so like I said you want it between about 100 and 104 degrees for this setup so if you were out what you would now do is grab your camshaft adjusters here so what you want to be doing is loosening all these off and then you want to be rotating it either advance or retard if we had too little we would turn it one way if we had too much we would turn it the other way so it can take a little bit of caressing before you get it right i've pretty much set this one up exactly where we need it so we're just going to go around and make sure all these bolts are tight then we can remove the center wheel and then start the reassembly process so having done this this method is a lot easier than using the previous method so the previous method that you would have used sorry let me just get this light in the right direction so the previous method that you would have been using is if you weren't using the vernier type adjustable chain you would have been using a standard chain which is completely fine um, but what you'd want to be doing is making those adjustments and then figuring out how many degrees offset you need for the crankshaft keyway so this little sucker down the bottom here which you obviously can't see but you saw before so that's what you want to be using as your offset so if we were out by say four degrees we would get a four degree offset crankshaft keyway we'd put it in and we'd recheck our measurements and if it came the right way we've set it right if it's gone the wrong way you've probably got the crankshaft keyway offset in the opposite direction so that's how you do it it is a lot of screwing around once you do get there and you understand how it works it does make it a lot easier as i said we were here till almost midnight the other day getting this done so let's start the reassembly process let's start putting the head gasket on actually before we do another tomo's tech tip so when you are replacing the head gasket on a 1275 a plus engine make sure you use the bk450 head gasket that is bravo kilo 450 this is the better material gasket and will last longer the original gasket that i used was just a standard copper one they're not as good for the fact that it actually costs 30 bucks for a standard head gasket or 60 bucks for the upgraded one why wouldn't you do it so let's go ahead and do that we've actually got some welsh plugs we need to replace or you might call them freeze plugs or i don't know engine block plugs or what i don't know butt plugs whatever you want um, we're going to be changing those as well so let's start the reassembly process um, i think i'm going to be waiting for the customer to decide whether he wants to clean up the original uh timing cover so this one here let me just grab it so here's one i prepared earlier um these are pretty much obsolete you can get them from specialist components in the uk you can um, get ones that have been fabricated to suit but this one in particular they you just cannot get them anymore so depending on what he wants to do whether he wants to clean it up or whether he's going to go ahead and get another one we just got to wait and see so we can probably start putting the head back on start the reassembly process and probably leave that till last so let's get to it
Okay, so now we've pretty much assembled most of the clutch assembly. Obviously the next thing we need to do is the clutch cover that sits directly on here. Now we do have a new clutch release bearing um, and a pivot as well. So this is the upgraded version that you can buy. This actually has a square hole compared to the original one, which is a round hole. So this is the original one here on the, my right hand side and this is the new one. So the benefit of this is because it's a square contact compared to a circular hole, it's a lot less likely to round off. So sometimes what you find is with these classic minis, sometimes that you get too much clutch pedal travel um, and it becomes apparent when you take the arm out that goes in here. So inside here is a, is a small ball and then on the end of the rod, as you put your foot in the clutch, it is activating by moving this either backwards and forwards depending on what you're doing with the car at the time. So how it wears is the ball inside here, instead of it being nice and tight and snug, over time it slightly wears laterally, so forward and back. So this hole actually becomes elongated. Now it might only be out by, you know, a few millimeters, you know, maybe even a few thou, just depending on how much tolerance. But the one or two millimeters it might wear in here equates to about 10 to 20 millimeters at the top of the arm. So it actually wears inside here, which then causes too much play, which then causes clutch engagement problems. So we're gonna piss that one off and we're gonna get the new one. Now the new one also has an upgraded arm as well. A lot more heavy duty, it's steel, it's um, a lot tighter and it will sit directly in there and it's got a lot less likely chance for it to be moving whatsoever because it is a nice snug fit. So this is an upgraded arm. They are quite expensive depending if you want to upgrade it, uh, but this cost us I think about 140 bucks Australian. So it is a worthwhile investment. Now we do have a new bearing on here. Good way to tell if the bearing is worn is just to rotate it and have a listen. So hopefully you can hear that. So that one is quite noisy, which is obviously no good. Um, so we've got a new bearing, which I've already installed, and that'll slide directly in here. Now, it is also imperative that you get this measurement correct when you're setting up your vehicle. The last thing you wanna be doing is over tightening this nut, which then in turn um, enables the clutch to bottom out. So if this is done up too tight, your clutch will bottom out and you won't get full engagement. So make sure when you set it up, uh, leave everything nice and loose. Once you've got the vehicle set up, properly, uh, you can then go and adjust this. The arm will only go in one way, so it's got a little groove cut out down the bottom here that you can see uh, where it will sit. So we just want to line that up directly with there. Once it's in, it also comes with a new split pin um, and pivot pin as well. So we just pull that little arc clip out. You want to make sure that when it is in the car, you can access it. So you don't want it to go down, for instance, uh, because when you go to pull it out, you might hit something depending how close it is to the firewall. So we're going to go from the front to the back, push it all the way through, grab your arc clip, and then just guide it straight down in there, just like that, and that's it. So that's on there, so that's moving, that's perfectly. Now we need to adjust this stop as well, but we can do that down the track. So let's continue on and keep the reassembly process going with the clutch. Now also, you probably did see, I went and marked all these bolts, um, even wrote my name on underneath here, and the one at the top here. Now the reason for that is, like we've spoken about before, it's always good to double check your work, and a good way to know that you've talked up something that is of great importance is to mark it. Um, I would much prefer them to see it and be upset about it, um, with a mark being on the block, or the gearbox casing, for instance, in this case, um, compared to it coming loose and then causing a catastrophic failure. So that's pretty much it for this episode. So we still have a fair amount more to go on the 1275 A plus engine. We still have both the inlet and exhaust manifold to go. We have a new oil filter housing, which we're gonna install. That's just some mad billet aluminium thing, which is gonna be pretty sweet. Um, we also have the clutch slave cylinder to install and to do the adjustment on the clutch 
uh, release fork as well. So we need to set the gap between this end stop and the arm along with the end stop here as well, but we can do that when it's on the car. Other than that, we also have a couple of Welsh plugs or core plugs, which are these here. I'm gonna show you how to replace those. We have a breather, which we're gonna be installing here as well. Um, we are still waiting on the distributor, the dipstick, obviously that's for the oil filter. Uh, we need to install an alternator as well, which will come down the track. It's not overly important just yet. Uh, we still have the front uh, timing cover to put on. I still haven't tightened any of these yet, so we'll do that down the track. I'm just leaving them there. Um, and the new rocker cover nuts. So these are really cool. We bought these actually from Specialist Components in the UK. Once it decides to come off, I can actually show you. So these are completely aluminium and um, hopefully you can see, but they've got their logo on the inside there if you can't. Um, they're like 30 or 40 bucks. Um, we still have to run the spacer underneath as well as the rubber grommet between there as well. So we can't just run it just like that because it doesn't seat there um, far enough, but that's fine. We can still do that. Um, see what he wants to do as well with the rocker cover because this stick is coming off. I don't know if we can still buy these. If you can, let me know in the comment section below as to where I can get it. Um, also, because we removed the old head, uh, the new one doesn't have any studs, so we need to obtain some new studs. Um, other than that, we're pretty much on track um, to get this thing ready for when we install it inside the car. So we're going to be installing it probably uh, this year, so in 2022. Um, as to when, it's just a matter of time, really. Once we've got the engine done, the next thing we're going to do is work on suspension. So I'll probably run all the lines uh, for the brake, for the fuel, uh, battery cable. Once you've done that, install the subframes and then just start building the suspension. So that's going to be a really fun build. And you guys are going to be with me every step of the way while we do it. And hopefully a couple of modifications along the way. I think he wants to mount the radiator to the body like I've got mine. So I'm sure you've probably already seen the episode that I did. Um, I'm filming this just before Christmas in 2021. Um, I'll be doing my Christmas episode soon. So by the time you watch this video, my Christmas episode will already be out. So hope you guys enjoy it. Other than that, guys, as always, stay COVID safe. Hope you have had a great time off over Christmas and New Year's. That you guys are nice and safe. And we'll see you next time on an episode of Tomo's Tune-Ups, all things DIY and mechanical.